Welcome to my session, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anand, and I'm the uh, senior technical evangelist from Manage Engine. So today we will be talking about uh, modernizing the threat detection and incident response in your SOC. It's going to be like a 15 to 20 minute session, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope that uh, every information that I'm going to provide you would definitely benefit your organization. So without any further ado, let me just quickly start the session. This is going to be the agenda for the today's session. So what are we going to discuss today is all about the IT security, okay? So the, the fundamentals of IAM Zero Trust and how Zero Trust and the IAM is going to complement your security solution that you have, which could be a SIEM or an XDR or whatever it is. But today we will talk a lot about this in form of an SIEM solution. We would also are going to discuss about the threat detection and the response. Also, how the zero trust is going to complement your cybersecurity. Finally, the suggestion, the best practices that you have to follow in your organization when it comes to the security, right? I'm gonna start with a quote, which is mentioned by Ted uh, Skillen and uh, you could see that, you know, let, let, let me just quickly read the code. It is, uh, there are only two different types of companies in the world. Those who have been breached and know it, and those who uh, have been breached and don't know it, right? So it's going to be two different things, right? The second thing is going to be more dangerous because they don't even know that a breach has happened. I will start with a few incidents that happen across the globe, okay? And uh, how the previous code is associated with these incidents, okay? As you can see right here, the first incident is, which happened in May, 2023, uh, that happened in North Carolina, a school, uh, there was an attack happen and the impact of this attack is the phone and the internet were not operational. So the school had postponed one of the event which is supposed to happen on a particular day and that eventually has conducted over online. The reason behind that is the internet got disrupted. This is the second attack and you can see that uh, the impact of this attack, the users have locked out from all of their machines. Now the correlation, right? So what is the factor that connects the two attacks is the cause of the attack is still unknown. This is the third attack and it's shame that it happened in uh, Dallas that do in a police department. Uh, the good thing about this particular attack is eventually the police department were able to identify the root cause of the attack. And that is because of a phishing email. One user has accidentally clicked the link, then a malicious script got injected onto his computer. That is how the attack got spread. And eventually the attack, the impact of this attack is the entire system got uh, uh, got hacked and uh, eventually the ransomware gang threatened the police that the, every information about the cops would be sold to the dark website. If you have not seen the, uh, the ransomware uh, message, this is the slide deck that you can see. This is going to be the typical ransomware message. And this is what even the Dallas Police Department got it when they were trying to access these sensitive files and folders, which got encrypted. All right, so coming to India, right? So what is that you have to see a lot when it comes to the cybersecurity, uh, uh, you know, cybersecurity incidents happen in India. There is 51% there is increase in ransomware incidents, right? And that too, between January and June of 2023, right? And over 60% of enterprises uh, reported a spike in cyber attack between February 2021 and January 2022. In the span of one year, there is going to be an increase of 61% of cyber attacks happen in India. Right, and the next one is a little bit critical. Over 
lakh cybersecurity incidents were reported till June 2022, right? The number is going to be a huge 6.74 incidents happened in 2022, right? I mean, until uh, June 2022. Why is this increase in the cyber attack? Okay, so I did an analysis and uh, uh, based on the information taken from various sources, this is my understanding, okay? So the attackers uh, these days are not behind a network, which means they are finding it, um, uh, you know, um, potentially easier to go after the identities rather than the network, which means they focus more on the designation, CEO, CIO, CFOs, rather than going inside the network to hack each and every um, uh, computers. It could be a, a, a workstation that is being used by the first line of technician. It could be the workstations that is being used by your employees. But what matters here is that they are after the designation, CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, so on and so forth. And why is that? Why is this room very easy for the bad actors? Number one, remote work. 25% increase in cyber attacks, uh, uh, you know, uh, have, have been identified, especially because of people working from home. I mean, the remote work. Then usage of SaaS applications, right? So the, as you can see the number here, it's by end of 2025, the market of SaaS uh, applications are going to be 25 billion, which is a clear indication that people are going after cheaper solution, which is pretty much available on the cloud. They don't have to invest a lot on the on-prem solutions. They are ready, ready to go for uh, sign-up solutions. So it's gonna be uh, cost effective for them. And of course, this emphasized the point number three, the use of hybrid and multi-cloud uh, uh, adoption by every organization. When it comes to a hybrid, they do have the on-prem solution still, However, they are in the process of going into the uh, cloud adaption, which means uh, some of the uh, could be a legacy applications that are still available in the on-prem and the new adoption is going to be on the cloud. So it's gonna be the hybrid environment. When it comes to the cloud adoption, generally Indians don't prefer to be with a single vendor cloud uh, uh, vendor. Okay, so they are not just going to go with uh, Google. They are not just going to go with the AWS. They are not just going to go with the uh, Microsoft Azure. It's going to be a combination of multiple vendors. So that is what the statistics is going to uh, tell us. Right. So coming to the top attacks, right? Uh, everything starts from compromising the password, right? So even Gartner emphasizes to use a very strong password. Uh, if you could uh, follow the Manage Engine's, uh, uh, you know, uh, blogs or Manage Engine's uh, uh, Shield classroom videos, you can see there are lots of attacks we have experimented in our test environment, okay? So uh, some of the sample information, some of the samples that we have taken based on the research, what we have done in our test labs is that, uh, an eight character password takes just about 39 minutes to compromise, okay? So you can see the number of characters, like eight, which has the uh, uppercase, lowercase uh, symbols, so on and so forth, right? So that's just going to take 39 minutes to get compromised using the, uh, using the uh, uh, brute force attack. So that's gonna be a very critical thing uh, that people needs to be, uh, 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 having an alarming factor about it, right? So this is how the password can be breached uh, based on the statistics what uh, uh, we have taken, right? So now that we understand how the cybersecurity is going to be very critical in every organization, let's go ahead and adopt the best technologies available uh, online, I mean, available everywhere. So let's talk about the IAM in the first place, Identity and Access Management. So what is an IAM? IAM refers to Identity and Access Management, which gives a digital identification to the users using which they can gain 
authorization over the resources that you have in your organization. So these are the four pillars of an IAM. What is the first one? Authentication, authorization, user management, and the central repository. Right? These four forms the pillar of an IAM. So the fourth one you can see right here is the uh, central user repository, which is nothing but the information taken from every devices that you have. What is the information? It is none other than the logs, right? So every change that you're gonna made in your system, it could be your firewall, it could be your antivirus, it could be your Active Directory, it could be your Azure Active Directory, no matter what that is, there is going to be a specific uh, location where you will have to store all the logs. Typically, that's the log aggregation uh, location using which you can get the information about changes, what has happened in your environment. That is one of the critical pillar of an IAM. Now comes to the zero trust. What is a zero trust? Zero trust is not a solution. Zero trust is not an application. Zero trust is not something that you can buy from a third party vendor and you can have it implemented in your organization. Zero trust is a strategy which works on the basic three principles. What are they? Never trust anyone, always verify. Number two, use the least privileged access. Number three, assume the breach that has already happened in your organization. So let's talk about the zero trust in a elaborate way. I find the zero trust as a additional security mechanism. Okay, in a layman's term, how is this going to work? Is uh, <clears throat> let's take up an example of a user who wanted to access something uh, within the organization, whereas the user is outside of the network. How can he get the uh, uh, resources? Uh, he can have uh, authentication. Once the authentication is done, there's going to be a secured tunnel that will get created between the end user and your network. And once the network identifies that the user has successfully authenticated, the user will be inside your organization, assuming, right? That's how the traditional network was going to work. The traditional network uh, will not understand whether the user is coming from outside the network or the user is within your organization. Once the authentication is completed, the user will be inside your organization. That is what the assumption of your network. Now, this is where the zero trust needs to come into the picture, where uh, the user will be validated everywhere. Whenever a user is, uh, <clears throat> is going to access to some authorized information, it could be an application, it could be a sensitive data, it could be uh, active directory where he has to access to it. Everywhere there is going to be a re-authentication. This is exactly what you call it as a multi-factor authentication. The effective usage of multi-factor authentication is going to bring a huge security uh, wall uh, and that's going to protect uh, most of all the sensitive data that you have in your organization. Now, comparing the zero trust and your um, uh, and the uh, uh, IAM solution that you have, what is that a very common thing, right? So, if anything on top of the head, you know, is all going to be the data, right? So, the data is the common thing between. Uh, the two uh, technologies, Zero Trust and the IAM, right? So we are after protecting the data, right? So when it comes to the data protection, what is the best thing or what is the first thing that you have to know? Classification of the data, right? So once the data is classified, how can you classify it in the first place? By understanding the information what you have. So anything that's going to be public, uh, that's okay, you can give the lowest priority or anything when it comes to uh, the most critical, for example, um, you have your uh, PIA information, the, the information about your employees, intellectual data is all gonna be the restricted one, right? So you're gonna focus more on the restricted data, correct? Nobody protect the data. So you have to periodically evaluate the the access so who has what access on the sensitive 
data that you have in your environment. That's number one. Number two, uh, give the least privilege to the data. Give the uh, least privilege to the users who are going to access the data. That's number two. Number three, periodically verify how many unauthorized users are trying to access your data. That's going to be the most critical thing, right? So that's how the data can be uh, <clears throat> Uh, can be uh, uh, protected. And uh, so these are all some of the uh, active directory specific attacks. Uh, and how could these attacks be prevented? It's once again, you will have to monitor what is going on within your environment. Okay. So now let's classify the attacks right here. Okay. So when it comes to end user, okay, or an endpoint devices, how are these can uh, easily get breached? With the help of a brute force like users can use a different uh, sequence of characters in that way they can brute force the information or it could be a, a password spray or a credential st uh, stuffing right so then the port scanning domain uh, recognizing uh, and also the lateral movement which is easily uh, uh, you know uh, done with the help of a misconfigured gpo or it could be a data exfiltration as well so coming to the uh, uh, last stage of the uh, uh, slide decks, okay? So the best practices that you have to keep in your mind, first thing is that perform the risk assessment. What do you mean by risk assessment? Understand who has what permissions on every information that you have. It could be your active directory, it could be the files and folders, which are very sensitive. Understand how many unauthorized users, I mean, how many users who don't want to have an access to it unnecessarily, you know? So these information has to be identified in the first place. Then effective, I mean, implement an effective policies. Number one, give the least privilege, okay? So uh, a be the sensitive data or an active directory, let's say the first line of technician who wants to have an access to the active directory, okay? Uh, he wants to do the uh, basic activities like user creation or a password reset. But make sure you don't give him the domain admin rights at all, which means based on what operation the user is going to perform on the active directory, make sure you give a very limited permissions to it. Okay. And just in time privilege access management is the best way to, uh, uh, to formulate uh, your sensitive data. Okay. So because a permission will be given to a particular user, okay, by adding himself to a group or giving the permission itself on the application and make sure the access is revoked automatically. You don't need to have a manual action to be done. It all has to happen automatically. That's the primary uh, 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 solution. That's the primary feature of a uh, PAM solution, privilege access management, right? And then continuously monitor and audit the user activities. What time the users are logging in, what time they are logging off from their computers, uh, who has what permissions, so on and so forth. The security functions has to be communicated with the top management every time. Every time it has to be connected, it has to be communicated to the top management to understand what is going on what kind of security mechanisms that you have. These were all the best practices. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope the session was useful. If you have any further questions about myself, you can reach out to me, anand.p at zohokarp.com. That's my email address. You can follow me at the LinkedIn, which is Anand Swami. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you all and you have a great day.